so welcome to How We Listen Live, the knowledge to move your music forward. Uh, so the agenda, what I do is I talk a bit about Vita, so everybody knows in case they don't know what Vita is. I talk about how we listen because I've just introduced an event that maybe you don't know what how we listen is. Um, then I do a couple announcements, stuff that we've got going on, people, things you might want to sign up for or more resources. And then part two is a conversation with uh, Sarah Hamilton, Sarah H, in this case, from Ditto. So my name is Mark Brown. For anybody who I haven't met before, there's a couple of familiar faces on this call or names or emails or chat messages. But for people who haven't met me before, I'm the founder and CEO of Vita. And my accent is a Canadian accent. It's not an American accent. Um, then I moved to the UK and started working in the music business there for 18 years. And then I uh, moved to Stockholm, where I live now, where it's 17 degrees. Uh, so yeah, I started, it, I think it's always important we do this with everybody we interview. We talk a bit about their background, because I think it's important when people are trying to learn about the way the music ecosystem works, is to understand where people come from and what their perspectives are, right? So I started back before, and this is going to come up with Sarah H. I, you know, I worked in a world pre-digital. So I started this small indie rock label in Canada, and it was all about trying to get records into stores, not trying to get attention for your stuff on Spotify. Completely different world. Then I moved to the UK. I worked at one of the UK's most important independent labels called Creation. Then I worked at another label called Poptones, where I started doing radio promotion which is basically trying to get records on the radio. And I did that for a while. And then I started my own boutique radio company. So that's my background. Then right around the time I decided to move to Sweden, uh, I realized that the way people in center receive digital audio is pretty backwards. It's still a completely massive mess. Uh, and that's why we started Beta. And then I moved to, the, to Sweden about five years ago. So, but what is Beta? This thing I keep talking about for you that don't know. Beta is the platform that enables sending and receiving of digital audio in a clean, simple, and secure way, built for everyone working with music today. And so, what does that mean? Fast, secure audio sharing. That's what we all do every day send and receive digital audio. Yeah. But why is Beta unique? Three things. I've got to move the. Uh, everybody's pictures. There you go. So we read and write file metadata. So as you all know, there's loads of information that lives in audio files. And we read that info, we read and write that information when you upload your audio to Beta, including WAV files. Uh, we control we'll allow you to control file formats and audio quality. So you can upload in one file format, share in another. And then also streamability which means that we have fast yet secure streaming. Streaming, you can't rip our links. And I referred to this big problem, the mess of sort of sharing audio and sharing music. Uh, we were the first people to ever release a white paper, a report on the state of music sharing. We did that earlier this year. Jamie, do you wanna throw a link to the, um, to the PDF in the chat. And you should download it, read it. Anybody who works with digital audio files and streams would be super interested in the research we did. Um, but then we have two parts to what we do. We have Beta and then how we listen, which I'm gonna talk about. And our mission statement is to provide artists and their teams with the tools and the knowledge to move their careers forward. So it's obvious that Beta is a tool for doing something. But we realize that people don't just need tools, they also need knowledge, right? And this is what I've just said. This is the way we do it. Beat is the tool, how we listen to the knowledge. And so what is how we listen? Well, how we listen is an interview series. It started as an interview series about two years ago, where every week we interview someone, different people from all over the world that do different jobs, come from different backgrounds, have different skill sets. And they talk about how they find and listen and discover and experience new music. And the reason we started this was we got super frustrated that 
you know, you read, everybody's seen this, that you read in the press or, you know, if you're a new artist or you're working in the music business and, oh, you know, what is the best way to get noticed? How do you become successful? Oh, well, you know, basically all you need to do is put your music up on Spotify or Apple Music or Deezer. And then suddenly, you know, the algorithm picks you up and it blows up. You know what I mean? Like, and it just, I could see Sarah Hamilton laughing. So it, it, exactly. And we just knew that it's not like that because we've all, everybody works at Bita, in and around Bita. Like we've all worked in the music business for years and we, it's just not true. And so the other myth is that, oh, you get on a playlist and everything's brilliant. And we wanted to dispel that by showing people just how nuanced music discovery and music listening is. Um, so what I, we like to do is I always like to talk about a couple recent posts. Jamie, if you want to post a link, to, uh, paste a link in the chat to all these interviews. Um, Darren Delgado is from Paradise is a German company, but I think Darren lives in the US and I'm probably saying his name wrong. Um, but I think these kind of interviews, they really highlight just how difficult it is to listen to all the music people get. And so Darren, Darren, Darren saying demo or promo links that aren't downloads are his frustration. I will download it right away and come back to listen to later. So I don't want to stream something and then request a download link if I like it. And so this is a big thing we notice all the time. It's certain people want streams, certain people want downloads. And if you read that white paper, this is what it's about, that there's no one way of doing things. And that's why the process is so messy. And then now we, so we have How We Listen is one series we run. Then we also have this other series, which is more artist focused, called Method to My Music. And that started running, I believe, in January. And now it's running every week. If not every week now, it's soon every week. So Hill, I think these are super important pieces of insight. Um, out of respect for the process of the artist, I keep the music I'm working on sacred and it does not leave the studio and is not shared with anyone until it's officially released. And this is something I talk about when I do talks at say music business schools or anything like that, that this idea that the big thing you have now, it's the concern is not piracy, but it's controlling your narrative how you deliver your music and release that to people into the world is the most important thing you have. And so that's why I assume Hill is saying this, is that you just don't want people to get stuff before it's finished, before you're ready for the world to hear it. So this is a new series that I, Jamie came up with, who's on this call, who organizes these events. He came up with this idea for some longer pieces that we run once a month and it's called digital dialogue and digital dialogue is an interview guest blog combined series presented by Bita, written by friends of Bita, exploring niche behind the scenes topics niche brackets nerdy behind the scenes topics within the digital realm of the digital music ecosystem so there's a couple of these are run, have run really recently and this is the most recent one Haley roscoe from blind blue she wrote a super detailed post on neighboring rights which i believe is quite a nerdy nerdy subject but people love it so jamie will post it in the chat um, there's a couple more of them too i think we've had three or four um, and so here's a quote from her piece so neighboring, I didn't even know what neighboring rights were. So neighboring rights are a type of royalty earned by performers and rights holders for the use of their recordings on radio, TV, public performance, or private copying. For example, if your track played on the radio or the shop or in a pub, you can get paid neighboring rights for that. So again, if you're, you're, if you're an artist or you're working in and around the music ecosystem, these are the kind of things you need to know. And I've worked in music for longer than I care to divulge. And I didn't actually really know exactly what this was because I didn't work in that area. Um, but ultimately everybody needs to know everything these days. And so that, that these pieces are super helpful for that. So how we listen live, what is it and uh, why are we doing it? It's basically 
those interview series are super insightful. They're fun to read. But every once in a while, people sort of show up and I think, oh, it'd be cool to talk to them in more detail. Because doing things live, you can have a, uh, there's a better vibe. It's easier than just answering these standard questions. And so we, we decided about, I think this, is, this might be number 12. So a year ago, we decided we should do an event where we can get people together. They can ask questions. You get someone who knows way more about something than I ever will. And we can discuss it together. And so that's the whole point of how we listen live is just to expand that knowledge and do it in a different way. Um, so we always have partners for these events. And one of one we're going to talk about when we talk to Sarah H. But then Gig Life Pro is run by Sarah G. And I'm going to get Sarah G, are you, let me pause this here. Um, Sarah G, are you to, be fa you to be found somewhere? Do you want to say hi? Hello. Hello. <laughs> so Gig Life Pro, you, you were writing in the chat, you came to one of our events and we've, I've taken part in one of, your events, yes. but do you want to tell everybody on this call who doesn't know anything about Gig Life Pro what it is and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, um, my name is Sarah Guppy. I am the COO of Gig Life Pro. Gig Life Pro is um, a platform that was built by music industry professionals for music industry professionals wanting to grow their business across the Asia Pacific. We, we do predominantly um, work within APAC but we are helping people through education and networking do business in Asia and also people in Asia do business out. So we offer insights and connections um, in a hope to empower people to grow their music business. It is a, we've got a free, um, a free tier, a premium tier and an all access tier, but anyone working in any level of the music industry is welcome to join our platform. Cool. And do you want to throw, oh, there. Jamie's already thrown a link in the chat. He's so all over perfect. it. Oh, he's, he's, yeah. he's we've, got this it. Down, we've got this down to a science. We've got this down yeah. to a science. So let me, thanks for that. Now let me. Thank you. Let me just get. There we go. So then also we throw a little money to Maytree every month. And everybody who works on these things, no one gets paid. Everybody, all the presenters, everybody does it for free because they think it's important. But we decided that it was super important to make a little donation to Maytree, which is a uh, respite for people with suicidal thoughts. And Jamie, if you can throw the link in the chat, but this is a super important issue, not just in the UK. Um, this organization has a uh, special resonance for us. But I like to highlight it every time because this is a universal problem that so many people experience, not just in music, but throughout life. And so it's very important to highlight, yeah? Um, I hate this slide because this is a slide that reminds me that I'm supposed to write some sort of blog post and talk about something myself, and I never do. Um, so this is just me where you can get a hold of me. Um, I'll throw my... Uh, info in the in in the chat you'll see it at the end you can screenshot it if anybody ever needs anything from me just get in touch especially on linkedin that's always good so a couple announcements depending on how people like getting their information we have a facebook group where we post about uh, any of these upcoming events and other things that are happening so jamie will throw a link in the chat to that youtube channel what's good to know is if it's the first time coming to one of these even if you can't make it, sign up to the event. You get an audio link directly afterwards. And then in a short period of time afterwards, these videos go, go up on YouTube so you can watch them again. So sometimes I've noticed that these things are so detailed, especially a couple of the ones recently, where you feel like maybe I should be taking notes the whole time. You don't need to do that. You can watch them on YouTube. You can go back to me, fast forward, whatever. It makes it way easier than just worrying that you missed a certain piece of important information. And then we always announce next month's event. So it's the 28th of June. Jamie, if you're going to throw a link in the chat, you can do that now. Um, we've never, we, we did our first, this is, this event's a pandemic event. We started doing it a year ago when there were no gigs. So we did have a booker recently 
from um, The Great Escape. And this is, but this is the first time we'll have had an agent on. And it's stuff that people find super important. So I'm expecting this to be super insightful. Um, so that's that. Um, and there are my details. If anybody wants to screenshot that, otherwise I'll put it in the chat later. And then I'm going to stop it. Now I need Sarah H. While I get some more coffee. Are you there, Sarah H? I am here, ready and waiting. And you seem pretty on the ball, Mark. You know, I know it's 10 a.m. and you're reaching for the coffee, but it seems fine. I'm, I'm faking it. I'm faking it, I promise. <laughs> so, so, so two Sarahs, both in Melbourne, both work together. Very confusing. Um, There's a lot of Sarahs. It's yes. It's a pretty common name, especially in the music industry. I feel like there's a lot of Sarahs in this industry. Is, it, is there? It maybe maybe yes. it's an age thing. Maybe it's an age. You know, if everybody was born between, between a certain period in Australia, their name's Sarah. Pretty so much. do you want to, why don't you tell people in two lines what you do, and then we'll talk about how you got to where you are, how you got to yeah, do sure. it. How does that sound? Yeah. Sounds good. Before I do that, though, I would just like to acknowledge the people of the Woi Wurrung and the Boon Wurrung uh, nations and the Kula nations from where I'm today. So if any of our guests from other countries, such as China and Kuala Lumpur, are a little confused about this, it is becoming common practice in Australia for people to acknowledge the First Nations people from the lands on which they're working. So those are the people, the Woiwurrung and the Boomerang people, that's where I am today. So I just wanted to acknowledge that first. And, and, and I would like to say Canada has been on that for, I don't know how it started in Australia. Canada has been on that for years. So any, right. any, any event in Canada, across Canada, everybody's got it memorized. So when we do stuff with that festival Sled Island, I was talking about in Calgary. Yeah. All always land acknowledgements on the East Coast in Halifax. So I think that's great that you're doing it there. Because that yeah. doesn't that doesn't ha it doesn't happen in Europe at all. So I'm glad you brought you jumped in. Thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just like to do that straight off the bat. Uh, so a little about me, I am currently the regional manager for Australia, New Zealand at Ditto Music. We are a music company, mostly distribution, but a bunch of other things as well. I've been there for nine years, which is longer than I would ever think that I would be at a job, but I'm not bored. But, but wait, when, when, when we were starting the call, it was only eight. Has it gone up by one <laughs> year within the last 30 year. minutes? <laughs> 30 minutes is a year. No, it's been, it's yeah. been nine years in oh, wow. yeah, yeah. past nine years. So quite a while. And I also co-founded a charity with a friend of mine called one of one, which is yeah. the other presenter for tonight. And one of one started as a website. We interview women and non-binary people in the music industry, and it's now turned into much more. Uh, but those are the two things that I spend most of my time on. Okay, so how did how how did you get going then? Like, what is your sort of the 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 arc for how you got to be where you are now? Yeah, sure. And I'll start out by shouting out to Peppa Jane, who went to high school with me. Nice to see you here. <laughs> we were both music nerds in high school, weren't we, Peppa? Um. So yeah, that's nice to see you. But yes, we're from a. I guess I'd call it a country town, rural town in Queensland, Australia. And I've always been a complete music nerd. I've been one of those people that since I can remember since the age of four, I just loved music and I knew that that's where I wanted to be. I used to have a little boom box that I would carry around uh, listening to salt and pepper was one or Kylie Minogue. So that gives you a bit of an idea of how old I am, but I would, you know, carry that around listening to that. Uh, and I've always known that I wanted to work in music, whether it was to be a musician, to be a music journalist, to work behind the scenes. I just knew that's what I wanted to be doing. So went to university after school um, and studied music. So I'm also a musician myself, not really practicing anymore. Um, I do have a piano behind me that never gets played, but definitely want to change that. Uh, but went to university, studied music. And then when I left, I saw a job opportunity for a digital distributor in Queensland. 
had no idea what it was. Uh, it wasn't a common job. I don't think anyone really knew what it was, but I ended up joining the first distributor that specialised in digital distribution in Australia. So that was in about 2005, so quite a while ago now. And, and, and this, it, I remember you were telling me the story about Netflix, because I found this, because this sort of came up yesterday. So you, were you in New York? What year was this? Where you were in New York and they didn't even have Netflix yet in Australia? Yeah, so I was actually, I lived in New York briefly um, in 2011. Okay. And so I'd already had some experience in digital distribution and iTunes was a thing. So iTunes was massive in Australia, but there was no Spotify and no Netflix. So I went over to the UK and Spotify was really starting to be commonly used. And I'd go to parties and people would be like, have you heard of this new thing, Spotify? And I loved it. And then when I was in New York, Netflix was really getting big. And I just thought this, there's something to this whole streaming thing. I, I feel like this is the future. And here we are. Because it came up yesterday, I was talking to someone and I'm like, we were trying to remember when Uber started. Like I can't, it's so easy to sit here and talk about digital this, digital that. But like yeah. Uber isn't that old. Like it, it's, Things have changed so radically, but I think that story is fascinating of how, it is. You, you know, like because growing up in Canada, in, in Canada, we had tons, we, we didn't have tons of things that the U.S. had. The U.S. had way more. And that idea that you can go somewhere else and see the way they do things and think, oh, wait, when this hits where I live, it's going to be a big deal. Is that how you were thinking about digital at the time? Like, oh, my God, yeah. this is going to be a big change yeah absolutely and I think Australia definitely has that feeling sometimes that we're a bit down under you know in some ways you know with internet related things we're not always straight on to it um so I definitely thought that you know this is gaining traction everywhere else it will happen here which it did I will also just say that I remember very clearly having a conversation with the guy that started Uber in Australia because it was the same thing. I was at this brunch and someone introduced him to me and he's like, yeah, I'm starting working with this startup. It's called Uber. You're going to be have an app and you'll be able to track your car. And I had that same thought of just like, ding, that's going to be huge. So yeah, it's, it's wild. It hasn't been that long, but has just, you know, disrupted and changed everything. The, so, so then when did you start it? Ditto? 2013. Yeah. Okay. So, and so, and so, and then, so, so what, and what do you do at Ditto? Did you say that already? So I look after the Australia, New Zealand artists labels. Okay. Uh, a big part of my role is searching for new music, deciding what we want to sign and then pitch for playlists at the DSPs. Yeah. Um, and basically just making sure people have as smooth an experience as possible. Okay. And so for people who sort of know what Ditto is, what what how is ditto different to all these other places like cd baby or whatever that, where you can upload your music yeah absolutely and there's a lot out there and i feel like it must be hard as an artist to try and navigate everything there's so much there's advertisements flying at you and artists have to put a lot of trust into whoever they decide to go with and have varied experiences but i guess i'll say that you're not usually locked in with a distributor. So if an artist goes with one for one single, you can then change it around. It's all quite fluid and all of these changes are happening behind the scenes. Um, but Ditto is a completely independent company, which I think is really valuable. So we're not- UK, owned by UK company, right? They started yeah. in the UK? Yeah, okay. Started in the UK by two brothers who, if anyone's a, a big Twitter user, if you want to follow some interesting people in the music industry, I'd say CEO Lee Parsons is an interesting person to follow. Uh, he definitely tells it like it is from his perspective and, and I view him as being quite a pioneer in the way that he thinks about things. And the ditto motto is to stay independent. Now we understand that major labels often have a lot to contribute and there's some amazing people working at major labels, but we think there's a lot of value in artists staying independent while they can. So they have creative control, can choose how things roll out, have that enjoyment and still have access to a lot of the same 
opportunities. Uh, so Ditto is completely independent, which I think is important. And we also have a global network. So I work really closely with uh, Gino in our Philippines team, who Sarah G also knows, with Chris, who's in New York, with our UK team. So we're actually really quite connected. And I think Ditto is at that level where we have the ability to make big things happen, but we're still a smaller team than a lot of other companies. So some companies you may get, you know, a lot of people use the term siloed, which is basically your put in your lane of Australia, New Zealand, and that's where you stay. At Ditto, we're often trying to figure out how we can get this artist attention in this particular market. How can we shop them over there and vice versa? So I think that's what is important about Ditto. And Ditto also has, we have two sides to the business. So we have our subscription service, which is similar to a distro kit or a CD baby. And then we also have um, our Ditto Plus and Ditto Plus we carefully select. I basically get to choose what I want to work on. So do all the other region heads. And then we try and promote those artists and, and get playlists and really push them. And we can keep that fairly lean. So I'm not sending thousands of releases to Spotify each week. I'm focusing on the ones that we sign and really trying to work with those. Okay. Cause I'm like, I'm super interested in what you were saying about like, you know, expanding out of, say Austria, like, because if we rewind to the non-digital world, it was impossible to get anything going in other countries. And now the, like anything else, it's super different. Like it's easy to get your music on Spotify in some other territory, but that doesn't mean anybody's listening. So I, I want to focus on that in a second, but should we talk about one of one and just when that started and why? Because I think these things are sort of, they work to, for me, they work together. The fact that, you know, it's highlighting different influences and in different types of people together. And it's the same with music. Do you know what I mean? Music doesn't need to be, it all stays in Australia, New Zealand, and it's the same with other parts of life. So explain what one of one is and how it started and then what you're doing with it now. Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of one, I started with a friend of mine. Basically, Australia has this thing called the Power 50 list, and it's the 50 most powerful people in the Australian music industry. And it used to be dominated by men, dominated by the big power players and CEOs. And there were always a few women on it, but we just thought to ourselves, this is frustrating because there's some amazing women working in this industry and they're either not highlighting what they're doing or they're not putting themselves forward or people aren't seeing them for what they're doing. And so we just had this idea to start a blog, start a website, uh, and we'd just interview these women and non-binary people in the industry that were doing great things and get their story. So the name One of One is actually a Jay-Z lyric about Beyonce, which is uh, she's one of one, none before and none to come, basically just meaning everyone has their own unique story. So we wanted to tell these people's stories. And so we started this website, not sure if anyone would ever read it. Uh, but when we launched, we had a happy, happy accident. We launched on International Women's Day and we had, you know, the Age newspaper, a bunch of blog articles, radio stations, you know, Triple J's hack, just asking us about this idea because it was something new and different. And it got to the point where the people that curate the Power 50 list were then asking us, is there anyone we've forgotten? Are there any other women that we should be highlighting? Um, some people have been hired based on their one-of-one -one profile. Someone's been like, I, I really want a, an agent. Who are some agents around? It comes up pretty high in uh, Google search history when you Google someone, which is cool. And after running the website, we've done that for seven years now. We also have events for International Women's Day as well. So. We've had huge support from, you know, places like Mushroom, you know, ARIA, Unified. Basically, the whole industry has really supported us to run these events. And the whole aim is to inspire people, to inspire people and highlight the women that are working in the industry who don't often put themselves forward. Because I think some women find it hard to really push themselves out there, um, which is why we appreciate opportunities like this one tonight to be able to tell our story. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, one of one's become something bigger than I thought it would. And we've got a lot of ideas for the future, but we just need to find the time to do it. But 
it's also just shown this real generosity from the community of people wanting to either support financially or volunteer. And again, it's completely independent. And I think there's a lot of power in that because we can move in the way that we want and we can do what we want because we're not controlled by powers that be. Because I think like what, when I think about Australia, like if we sort of rewind, like this idea of community, right? Like, because this comes up a lot on these kind of calls, like even from the first one with Hugh Stevens, this guy from Radio One about like cre creating community online and local and what the hell does local mean in a digital world? And when I think about, I, if you go back to Australia, like say 20 years ago, like a certain type of music got exported and the idea of what was Australian was just it was certain types of music really do you know what i mean what like kind of and, who do you think of well you like think like if you re, if you rewind if you rewind like only certain band only certain bands made it out do you know what i mean like yeah all, it, you know you had to be big in australia and then because the way the way it used to work was somebody needs to be big somewhere and then it can be exported and i think yep. that doesn't everything's already been exported now because of the way digital works. And I think that's sort of what I really wanted to start talking about, because that seems to be what you know so much about this idea that, okay, well, I live in Australia and I do this, but I work at this global company and we work with all these different types of artists and they all have different ways forward and different opportunities and you don't just necessarily wait until they're huge in australia and a pre like because i think what those power lists are is it's a it's some way to give someone approval for their work and and what one of one is about is it's like no there's like loads of people who we should be highlighting not just a select list of people right and i think yeah. that parallel between people who work in music and around music and artists who don't, maybe don't need recognition at home. Maybe they would do better in another territory. And I think, so, so let's talk a bit about that. Like, what do you do? Like your job, talk about finding new artists in Australia and maybe the way it used to be and what you think is the way it works now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I totally agree that it used to be artists had to pay their dues, tour around the country in a tour bus, and then maybe, you know, go over to the States, but very difficult to kind of cut through and, and everything's changed. Uh, whereas now I definitely have a bit of a lens of when we're looking at which artists to work with. One of the first questions I'll ask is, are there any other regions that you think would be able to pitch this to? So asking them if they've toured anywhere else, if they might have, you know, some ethnicity from a certain region that we can use when we're pitching into that region, what the sound is. Um, as an example, just last week, we had one of our artists who is an Afrobeats artist who uh, was signed by Gamirez, who works with me at Ditto. He does our hip hop A&R and also works on a lot of Afrobeats artists and R&B and got great playlisting in Spotify Africa and not as much here in Australia. But that's because we discussed it with our team in Africa. They'd pitched it there. We'd given them everything that they need. They know the local market. And so that kind of thing happens all the time. Um, and I think things can happen quickly. We know with TikTok, things can just take off really quickly, but YouTube as well. Um, and it's often about a particular sound rather than the location of where the artist is from. Um, we haven't worked with her at Ditto, but I'm a big fan of the artist Sampa the Great. And I know she's doing really well internationally at the moment and in the UK. Um, I'm not sure if people necessarily know where she's from because it's more about the sound and the music. Yeah. So like, but I'm trying to think like how you can't go from nobody knowing who you are to being sort of like, big on TikTok in the sense that you need to get your music released and then you need to have some sort of support for people that know people to know who to talk to and sort of lead through. So like how, how, how do artists in say, because I think this works in all territories, how do artists, how do you find 
newer artists in Australia? Like, what are the, what are the ways, like, if you think about this idea of how we listen, like what, what is it that you find is most effective for stuff ending up on your radar? Do you go to a lot mm. of gigs? I guess you didn't go to a lot of gigs last year, but maybe you do now. Like what, what are those, what, how do things reach you, do you think? Yeah, definitely a variety. And after being somewhere a long time, a lot of people have my email address and my phone number. So I definitely get sent Cold a lot calls, of cold calls. You get a lot of cold yeah. calls. Really yeah. cool. <laughs> and I have to say, I will always respect the hustle. Actually, I was um, I was at the airport on Friday. I was traveling up to Byron Bay just for a little holiday. And I was I ran into someone I knew and I was talking about Ditto. And then it was really cute. There was a, a guy behind me, a blues musician, and he's like, I'm so sorry, I hate doing this, but I heard you work at Ditto. Can you please listen to my CD? And uh, I respect that. I respect people that put themselves out there like that because it's not easy. And I also had to do that when I started Ditto in Australia. No one knew who I was. No one knew who Ditto was. So I had to kind of hustle and get people to know what we were doing as well. So I'll definitely respect that. And we did listen to the CD and it was great. And I sent him back an email today because I do think it's important to kind of act with integrity where you can. And if you tell someone you'll listen to it, listen to it. Um, But yeah, I get a lot of cold emails and, you know, it might take me a week or two to get through them, but I do listen to that stuff. Uh, definitely live shows because I think there's a certain magic and there's a certain kind of connection within the audience that you can't describe and you can't see via streams and seeing that energy in person is really special and might make me want to work with an artist more so and is also a reminder if I'm already working with them that I have to work really hard because they're working really hard. Um, and then also just conversations like, you know, my friends that work in music and I, that's what we're into. We talk about bands all the time. We go and see stuff together all the time. Um, but I think it's important just to touch on the diversity side of things to make sure there are other people finding music and making these decisions, which is a part of the reason that, you know, I think it's important for people in positions like mine to change and there to be people of color and First Nations people in these positions because I don't think it's right for the same kind of person to be making the choices as to like what should be pitched and what should be playlisted. And I think those changes are happening across the board. I know they're happening at the DSPs like Spotify and Apple, et cetera. And there's still a huge amount of change that needs to be made, but I'm also aware that I'm getting older. I'm in my mid thirties now and I'm not always going to connect to the stuff that younger people are listening to as well. So, you know, we have interns, I'll ask them what they're into. It's about getting a bit of a cross section of of people's taste and what they like as well. So it's that, but then also I've got to say it's data and analytics. Like I've got, Ditto's got this huge number of artists and we can see what's doing well. We can see what's doing well on Instagram. You know, we, we look at the data as well um, and go from there. So there's a lot of different ways, but I do think that a few times when I've decided to work with an artist who I can tell has something really special, it just connects and it just happens and it can feel easy when something flows because they've got that, that special kind of talent or X factor or whatever you want to call it. So, okay. So Oh, one thing I want to highlight, I thought it was super interesting that, that one of the first things you said about when you start working with an artist, you ask them what, what they know or what their connections are or where they expect the music to do well. Because when I do, again, when I do a lot of talks, I'm always like, look, everybody's looking for someone else to tell them what to do, but it's the artist who needs to know who they are. Like, you know, where they are and where they're going. Like I wrote this blog post about here and there. It's like, you need to know where you are and where you want to go because people like yourself, they're only there to help the artist move forward. Do you know what I mean? So you, you, it, not every, everybody can't do it by themselves, but they need to know artists or people who work very closely like the managers need to have some sort of vision and context. And so like, 
because starting in Canada, I remember like we Canadian bands couldn't get arrested in the U.S. or anywhere. It was brutal, long. But now, like Canadian music is super popular. But back then, it was impossible. So when we were talking like last week, we were talking about like there are those parallels, and it's like it, being in a smaller quote unquote market like Australia. Is, is that is that a good thing? Like, so somebody comes to you you like the music, there's a vibe, you can tell that they know what they want. Like, what what are the next steps on a general level, not genre specific, that when you start working with a newer artist that maybe does some shows in Australia, maybe he's had a bit of online interest? Like, how do you start working with them? What, are the, what do you do with all artists as, as they start to get going? Yeah. Well, I do like to connect people where I can as well. And I think there are some really great operators in Australia, whether they're managers, publicists, radio pluggers, doing digital marketing. And so I might suggest some people that they work with, Sarah G as an example, or you know, some other um, great people out there, because I do think the team is really important to get right and make sure that you have people that really genuinely believe in what you're doing. Um, one of the great things about Australia being a small place is just... A lot of people at Spotify, et cetera, and Apple, like they're across what's happening. They kind of, you know, it's not like there's just hundreds of thousands of acts in like there is in the US that you just cannot be on top of everything and you can't kind of wade through it all. It's like a lot of people are really on top of what's going on. So I think once something starts to connect and take off, it's, it's kind of easier in that way because everyone's across it. Um, but yeah, I think usually I will ask, questions of the artist just to kind of gauge what they'll be like to work with, how well they know their music and the market. I think it's always a little bit of a red flag if you ask an artist, you know, what do you listen to or what kind of artist do you see yourself similar as? And they say, oh, I don't listen to other music. I'm just concentrating on what I Does that doing. happen? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Just in their own lane and, and don't really kind of know what else is happening out there. Another question I'll ask is, what playlist on Spotify do you think your music will fit on? And if they come back with a list and it's quite appropriate, I'll be like, cool, they get it. If they come back with, you know, I don't know, that's your job or I, um, you know, crazy playlists like hot hits that just, you know, they're a tiny artist and the only artists on hot hits are your Harry Styles and whatnot. Um, I'll see that there's a little bit of a disconnect, but I will say that I think a lot of artists and self-managed artists because they've got things that they can access in YouTube and think they're just smart and they just often come back with everything all sorted and it's quite impressive, really. Um, we do work with a few artists who have previously been signed to major labels and just had everything done. And then it's really uncomfortable for them to then come to Ditto where we're like, we're not going to tell you what to do. We're not going to set up a marketing plan for you. You're in the driving seat. You tell us what you want to do. And it's just this kind of shift in power of like, oh, okay, I need to figure this out. And it's really interesting. But yeah, lots of independent artists are just on it. They're super smart. They know what they're doing. And that makes it easy for me. Oh, but but I, I, I've got one question because a friend, she makes music and I was telling her, okay, like, look, you need to sort of figure out what you sound like. And she's like, that is the, like, I don't, it's such a hard question to look at yourself, oh, you yeah. know? And, and, and so like, like it, this is a ridiculous question, but do you have any tips for, the, because you know what I mean? Like I could say, if I made music, I could say I sound like X, but I totally sound like Y. <laughs> like yeah. I, 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 it, I think it's intimidating for artists to have to analyze themselves in an artistic way. Like they're, cause they're not naive that they're unique necessarily, but more that they don't. So how do you, it's a it's a crazy question, but like, how do you figure that out? Like, ask your friends, or ask, or like, or see what suggestions come up on Spotify. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's a very hard question for an artist to ask. Oh, totally. And a lot of people find it really hard to talk about themselves. But yeah, I I did a workshop recently with the, uh, it was the hip hop university, so they're all hip hop artists, and we went around the the Zoom, and everyone introduced themselves. And so many people just dropped in like one sentence exactly what they were like. And they had so much charisma and so much pizzazz when they did it. I was, I was really impressed. And I think it's really good to just have one sentence 
like I hate the term elevator pitch because it sounds really entrepreneurial yeah. and funky, but to just be like, I make music. Very like, hip hop though. Very hip hop yeah. to be into entrepreneurial. Like, yeah, yeah, totally, so, totally. Yeah. They yeah. killed it. So I'd, I'd say having just a sentence that is what your music is that you feel comfortable with, that you can just spit out when you are introduced to someone is really good. And then some artists will put together a whole PDF with a vision board and influences and things like that. And if you're a visual person and you've got this whole idea around what you want your aesthetic to be, that can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, just, just having a bio, a bio and an elevator pitch. That's all you need really. Yeah. So, okay. So then we're thinking somebody's, they, they've, they become self-aware enough to understand who they are and they, and they, you've had these conversations with them like that. Okay. This is where it might work and all this kind of stuff. Like explain because because domestic stuff is sort of, you can understand it. You know the radio stations, you know, if you can get played on the radio, you know, you can do gigs. But when you're thinking about these other territories, how, like pre-digital, it was hopeless, right? I'm never going to get to the UK unless all these things happen here in Australia. But like with digital, like you said, that you look for other territories, like how is that? even possible is it because you understand what's happening musically in all these other territories or <laughs> that these markets are open to more diverse music from different places like what's changed and then what's the strategy or what strategies can artists employ to try to get in other territories even even when they're still building their own home territory yeah, totally. And I, I definitely don't understand all of the markets around the world, but yeah. that's why yeah. it's good to have people in my role at Ditto around the world. And so what I'll do is I'll literally just send them the music and a press release or a bio or something like that and then just say, do you think this can work in your territory? And then they'll come back yes or no. And then we pass that transparency back onto the artist. So we might, like I think I was saying to you the other day when we caught up, I used to have an idea of what music worked in the Philippines until I went to the Philippines and was like, oh, no, it's a different kind of R&B than what I thought it would be. I remember, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess we really rely on the local knowledge um, of the people in my role around the world. So Ditto UK, for example, you know, we have a lot of hip-hop there. Um, there might be a sound in Australia that's really popular but sending it to them, they'll just be like, no, this is not going to work here. This is this sound is not big here. And then we'll just explain to the manager or the artist, like, this track is probably not going to work there. We won't be able to pitch it there. Um, so I think just having people with the local knowledge, and then I do understand the local scene here. Like, obviously, not every single niche and scene, but then I might go to some friends or, you know, someone else on the team at Ditto and be like, do you think this could work here? So I definitely rely on other people's opinions and expertise um, as well. So that's definitely part of it. But I think that if there's a particular reason as to why you can pitch into a territory, always make sure you tell the person that you're working with, such as, you know, we had an artist who was born in South Africa but lives in Sydney. We can pitch that into South Africa because, you know, same as if someone's from Australia but they're living in London, we can pitch that here or if someone's toured somewhere, but you don't want to be spending too much time trying to, you know, get a playlist in Russia. If you've never been to Russia, there's absolutely no reason not no to. No playlist in Russia anymore. That's- Yeah, exactly. That was a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, pitch, pitching to a territory where there's no music. That's yeah. a dead end. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a bad example, but um, no, yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm joking, I'm joking. No, 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 you're right. Uh, so, yeah, you've got to actually think about, is there a reason? Um, the other <laughs> yeah. thing is... Uh, research. Cool. research. Research, Sarah. One needs to research. <laughs> they do need to research. And then there's also the data side of things too. Yeah. So, you know, if someone says to me, um, I've got 100,000 monthly listeners in Peru, we'll pitch into Peru. So we just need a reason. And like... Do you have any examples of like these, because I, I like sort of weird success stories. So like, can you tell me about a couple artists in 
in Australia that do well internationally that might not do well, um, might not do well at home. Like, do you know what I mean? That are doing, because there's this uh, conference in Toronto called the Glo Global Toronto. And we've been friends with them for ages. And I've talked to the, one of the people there a lot about how artists have this idea that they, they, so they feel isolated. Do you know what I mean? Like it's much uh, more diverse artists, this, this conference and this festival. And because then they're in Canada and can Canadian music can be quite bland or whatever. I think it's very good for artists to hear of other artists who are able to make progress in places where people respond to them better. Does that make sense? Like, and I wonder if you have any good examples of how it went for people in Australia. Yeah, well, the first act that springs to mind is an act called Aviva, who have done over 2 billion streams um, on Spotify and YouTube. They're playing Mad Cool Festival. They're supporting My Chemical Romance. Massive. Most people in Australia haven't heard of them. Or if they have, it's because they're in that particular niche. Um, but they've done amazingly well and they've been pretty much completely independent the whole time. But they used YouTube a lot to really tap into their fan base. And they had success on some of the YouTube channels like Mr. Suicide Sheep and that kind of thing. That Mr. Went over Mr. Suicide Sheep? Is that what you said? Yeah, have you no, heard of that before? No, no, I'm writing that down. Mr. Is it is it is it written how it sounds? Mr. Yeah, Suicide yeah, all, Sheep. Okay, yeah. All lowercase Mr. Suicide Sheep. So there's these YouTube channels. Um, they've got a label now as well, Mr. Suicide Sheep. Very, very random name, <laughs> I know. Um, and they really supported Aviva. And so Aviva built this huge following on YouTube, and then that moved over into Spotify. Um, and now Aviva is a woman, she's actually just written a book and gotten a publishing deal and her book's everywhere. Um, but basically they've created this world and really built this massive fan base that will follow them to all of the different platforms. But they do incredibly well. Um, and I don't know if they've had much commercial radio play on Australia, you know, Australian radio stations. I don't think they've been played on Triple J it's all online and it's all in this world of fans and they're yeah touring the world without people knowing knowing their name in Australia which is pretty cool wow I just want to say if anybody has any questions throw them in the chat and I'll add them in so like <clears throat> you, it, I think we should we should sort of talk about playlisting the nuts and bolts of it because I find when we've had people on that talk about playlisting people love it because people want stuff that they can take away so sure. explain your the specific job you do as far as pitching the playlists what what do you like it's part of your day or whatever right so what, what do you do exactly you pitch all different types of artists to playlists in australia or how do, how does that part of your job work yeah sure yeah so because Ditto has the two different streams, a lot mm -hmm. of our artists go out through subscription and I don't pitch their music to the different DSPs. They pitch it themselves via Spotify for artists. And if anyone's kind of starting out, they can pitch their music themselves via the Spotify for artists pitching tool. But then if we do what, sign... What, 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 out, how long should... How, sorry to interrupt. How long in advance? Because timelines... I always talk timelines because... Artists don't understand oh, yeah. timelines. <laughs> so oh, yeah. how much in advance should, even if they're pitching via Spotify for artists, should they give, should they give? Four weeks or a month is best. Yeah. Okay. But I will just say to any artist, get all of your assets together before you set a release date. Because otherwise what happens is you go, cool, I've got a show on June 17th. So my song's going to come out on June 17th. I'm just waiting on cover art. I'm just waiting for the final master. Shit happens, they, you don't get stuff back in time and then you really push for time and you pitch it a couple of days out and no one sees it and it's a missed opportunity. So always wait until you get all of your assets together like four your weeks. cover art. Yeah, go. and I'd say four weeks is optimal. Yeah. Um, the, the longer the better really, but I would say four weeks is fine. And that's, that's the timeline we use uh, when we're pitching something. Um, but yeah, it, 
the Spotify editors and the other DSP editors, they're on top of stuff. Like if, if you've got some stuff happening and you pitch your song through, even if you're not signed to Ditto or you're not signed to a major label or whatever, it can still be picked up for playlisting. It's they're they're on top of stuff, which is cool. Um, but, but you yes. do more active stuff for the for the yeah. Ditto. So, so so let's talk about that because that's where you're getting more into the nuts and bolts of stuff, right? Yeah, sure. So if we sign someone to Ditto Plus, um, then we pitch to all of the DSPs that are in Australia, and then I'll also be pitching it to the Ditto. Uh, people in my position around the world so they can pitch it to the local editors. So it's not just Spotify. So at the moment, Spotify is the only DSP you can pitch yourself to, but there's Amazon Music, there's Apple Music, there's YouTube Music, there's... We also try and get our Ditto Plus artists played in retail spaces, like um, there's Cusick who puts music in 7-Eleven and McDonald's and nightlife who puts music in pubs and gyms and stuff like that so we're basically trying to get our ditto plus artists into these uh stores but then also placed on playlists um we also have sync and publishing at ditto now so we'll also be trying to get sync placements and that kind of thing too but yeah basically when we pitch something we get a lot more information so we ask for the bios and the press shots and uh, 100 words about the song, moods, all that stuff. And then we basically get all that information and then put it in the different ways that the DSPs like to receive it. So some might like this kind of a form, some might like it emailed this way. I have meetings, I have calls. Basically, yeah. I'm getting that information and then I'm presenting it to, to everyone else. Yeah, that's back to the same thing, like what I was talking about music sharing at the start. It's like, how do people do things? Well, it depends yeah. who they are, where they live, what they do, what their age is, you know, what yeah. the preference is, what side of the bed they woke up on. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. If they saw the email. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. So, 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 and, and so, so basically playlist pitching for you is you talk to people that run the different playlists and then do they have, they have editors above them that, that, that guide the, because we had a great guy from on, on from Deezer junior like six, six months ago he's gone to napster now but oh. i he really that was the first time i i had ever really understood the way it works and so it's like you have individual people running playlists most of the time and then editors above it and do you talk to all of them is that sort of the way it works yeah well the editors are the ones that are curating the playlists and so depending you know spotify might have five to 10 editors and then some label representatives who I talk to as well. Um, you know, Amazon might just have a couple of staff in Australia, for example. It depends on how big, you know, the office is as to who's making those decisions. But yeah, um, people will select which songs they want to be on a playlist and Spotify, for example, has different kinds of playlists. So there's the editorial ones, which is all selected and curated by an editor. And then there's personalised ones, which is kind of half and half. So it's skewed to whatever kind of music you listen to. So Spotify is always learning what your listening habits are and your behaviours. And, you know, it'll see if you listen to the Kid Leroy a million times and then you'll get a lot of Kid Leroy stuff sent to you. So a combination of the machine and the human editors um and then yeah there's the algorithmic playlists like daily mix and release radar which is curated just for you and most of the dsps will have something similar so they'll have some playlists like new music friday brand new music on amazon new music daily on apple and then some that are curated depending on what you listen to um, so it's basically the same as radio plugging, I guess, because there's people like the music directors who make those decisions. There's the editors who make the decisions on the playlists. Um, so we pitch a few weeks in advance and then I'll also repitch. So I'm going back to them saying, Hey, can you please take another look at this song? It's just done this. Or they've just had this article written or they've just supported this person. Um, can you please take another look? Or I'll be like, look at the data here. This is how many saves they've gotten on Spotify. Can you please take another look? So I'm also re-pitching things as well. The uh, the re-pitch, uh, that, that's quite interesting. So do, do you find that that works? Go in, because um, I, I would call it the nudge. The yeah. art of the nudge. <laughs> what all anybody who works in and around music needs to understand. The art of the, oh, by the way, this, hey, the yeah. nudge. 
It does it, and do you find that that works? It can do, and yeah, the nudge. I say that word all the time. I'm like, I'll give them another nudge. Um, the repitching works if there's a good reason, as in there's some activity happening. It's it's not usually successful if it's just like, hey, listen to this song again. Hey, this song is still here. I've yeah. got to be like, this <laughs> is still here. I'm hi. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, I'm still <laughs> active. But I I think like back to the timeline thing. That's what I always tell people. You need to, you, the reason you have a timeline is so they can ignore it, forget about it, lose it, and then finally listen to it. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't think I, I and these are the reason I ask all these questions. I think it's so hard for artists to imagine what's going on. Yeah. What's you know how the machine works, and that's why again the Deezer conversation was eye opening because I didn't even yeah. know how it all, how it all works. But there was. This, so Paul in the chat, I don't know if you can see the chat. Yeah, I can. He asked yeah. this, uh, like, I think this question is super interesting, partly because what we're talking about, like, he he's asking about all these, the context around Ditto. Can you explain some of that? Because I think it's also good yes. for newer artists to understand how big these companies are and how they work. So do you want to answer a couple of those questions? Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so how many artists signed to Ditto in our territory? I'm not sure exactly, but I would say it would be getting up to a thousand or so that we've signed to Ditto Plus. And the, how many artists do I personally work with? We usually release between five to 10 tracks a week that are signed to Ditto Plus in Australia alone. And then I also will be pitching some of the international stuff too that I think will work here, or there's a reason to pitch it here in Australia. Um, but I try and make sure that I don't have artists of competing genres. So I will not pitch two very similar country tracks on the same week. I will have that conversation and say, hey, I've already got a, a country track. Sounds a little similar. Would you consider pushing your release date back and have those conversations just so I don't have artists competing with each other? Um, we're just a small team in Australia. There's four of us. Um, and basically Ditto has a few bigger offices. So we've got a big office in Manila, which I went and visited before COVID, which was amazing. So there's quite a few staff there. And then why a big, a sorry to interrupt, why a big office in Manila? Why does Manila have a bigger office than Australia? Uh, we have a lot of staff that are working on the support and content. So the delivery of the ah, music and the okay. subscription okay. side of things. So our support team are based there. Um, and then we have a, a big office in Liverpool and London. And then Ditto has a lot of smaller satellite offices with, say, two to five people around in the rest of the world. So um, that's why we've got a smaller office here. Um, and then someone's asking, oh, Paul's asking about launched any artists in the Philippines with Gino. Well, we've had some artists that we've definitely pitched into Southeast Asia. Um, What's Genomina, by the way? I don't know what Genomina is. So he's in my position, but in the Philippines. Oh, my God. So this is, I wonder okay. if Paul knows Gino. Um, that's interesting. But Gino's, Gino's great. Um, so, yeah, we have worked on quite a few projects together. Also, you know Gino and you had in-person meetings with him in Manila. Yeah, great. That's awesome, Paul. Yeah, so we've worked with a few Australian artists that we've pitched into Southeast Asia, an example would be Yo, Y-E-O, an amazing R&B artist. Um, so he's gotten some, you know, New Music Friday across Asia. Um, we definitely try and pitch him in there. There's an emerging artist that I'm a big fan of called Mung Mung. She's like a cool rapper, pop, um, R&B artist. And so we've also got some great playlisting in Southeast Asia for her. And I guess I'll also say that we focus on Spotify a lot in Australia and, and a lot around the world, but you've got to think that other regions like in South Korea, for example, Spotify's tiny. They don't care. They've got other platforms that are massive. And in China, for example, the same thing. And, and that, that again is that personal bias that I use Spotify. And then, and this is the same when you're sharing music with people. It's like, Oh, I only need streams. So I'm, I'm only going to yeah. send streams to people. And it's like totally wrong. Like, there are loads of other platforms depending on the territory. And that's that personal bias. You think you know exactly what people want. It's actually like, no, yeah. no, it's a completely different. When we had, um, we had a couple of someone on from S South America and they, they had like, it, it used to be all via telephone and this, that, and the other thing. So we've got 
two questions in here. First, Sister Miriam asking, do you work with any artists who play reggae? And then someone else is asking, Ian's asking about Africa, Ghana. So do you want to take those yeah. two questions? Yeah, for sure. I'm guessing Sister Miriam, that sounds like a reggae type name. So um, we do have some reggae artists, to be honest. A lot of the playlists for reggae aren't curated in Australia. They're curated elsewhere. So I don't personally know the editors of those ones. Um, we did work with, and we work with a label out of Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, and they have a lot of reggae. Uh, there's an artist called Barker Solomon, who's really cool, Jarrah Local. Um, so they've got an audience and we've pitched that, but it's a little bit tricky, but I'm always happy to take a listen and then I can ask someone in the US or elsewhere where those playlists are curated to see if they can work with it. But um, yeah, it's a, a lot of reggae stuff's curated elsewhere. Um, hopefully it makes, you know, it, it can kind of get a bit more popular here. I think people's tastes are diversifying and people want to listen to different things. Like there's a new playlist on Spotify called Afrofusion. And that's because there's a lot of Afrobeats artists in Australia that are coming up and weren't getting a look in. So I think the more diversified people's taste is, the more playlists and it's that kind of chicken and egg thing. And then Ian's um, question about Africa, Ghana. Yeah, so um, I work pretty closely with our team in Africa, actually, which is really fun. Um, we've worked with an artist called Mike Acox, who is actually, he was in Sydney for a time and then he's recently been in Ghana. Um, so we have a radio person in Africa. And again, that was all mind blowing to me because the way that radio works is so different over there. And you, it's not the same as in Australia. So you need someone with that local knowledge. Um, yeah, we work with um, quite a few artists from Africa and Ghana. Um, and we also sometimes pitch them into the UK as well, because obviously that's a big scene, Afrobeats in the UK also. Um, so we've done quite a bit there. I've, I've got a friend who works with a lot of Ghanaian artists as well. So she's always sending me that, um, their music, which I personally love. So, um, yeah, Ian, if you've got something you want to send through, absolutely do it. <laughs> Take a listen. So, and then I guess, um, cause we're, we, we might have to wind down here. So, but, but do you want to, if no one else has got any questions, do you want to throw your details in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, so what, just, why don't we do last call for questions, if anybody's got anything before we wind down. What time is it there now? Seven. You don't have yeah, a gig tonight, yeah. do you? No, the no. Other, my, oh, good. The other Sarah tonight. had a gig. Yeah, no, not tonight. I'm actually going up to the Vivid Festival in Sydney this weekend, which will be cool. Which festival is that? It's called Vivid. So lots of musicians, lots of artists, and then they have light projections. So the Sydney Opera House has these amazing light projections all over it as well. Oh, wow. Cool. So Paul's asking about your own personal music taste. Oh, thanks, Paul. I love this question. It changes. My God, it, it really changes a lot. I instantly want to say I love Neo Soul. I love like Hiatus Coyote, Sampology, Alicia Joy, there's an artist from New Zealand called Wallace. I love a lot of neo soul type stuff. Kait is another artist who I love, a beautiful R&B artist, Mahalia, UK artist. Um, but then I've also gotten pretty into hip hop as well. So uh, I like a lot, of, a lot of that stuff. And then I also will listen to a lot of indie music, singer songwriters. Um, so yeah, it's pretty eclectic and it, it does change. I'll get often really into a sound and then I might burn it a little bit and then move on to something else or something else will just excite me as well and I think I heard some statistic that's like a lot of people once they reach their mid-30s they listen to old music and I love a lot of music that's been released in the past and everything but I still love new music and I still think it's so exciting and interesting and definitely breaking the norm there of, of still liking to listen and find new stuff. Oh okay so fi final question and it relates to this to, to sort of square the circle whatever the expression is so <laughs> how do you think is it so because the age thing you're right as you get older the, the, the dynamics change what you listen to but how and because i think this is an important question how do you think your music tastes has been affected by the way you listen to music 
So say when you were when you were super young, you basically only had one or two records because you didn't. There was only digital. Now you have access to everything. How do you feel that your the way you listen, your listening behavior has changed after this transition from analog to digital? Does oh, that yeah. make what sense? What a great question. Yeah, great question. And oh, I'd love to actually hear from In everyone. In one sentence. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have to stop myself from putting my marketing brain on to listen to whether I think something will fit on playlists and let it wash over me. That's easier to do when I see something live or I do things like we'll put on a record or put music on in the car and turn it up loud. If I'm listening from my laptop, I'm listening from music business side of things, but I listen to it in those other scenarios to just let it wash over me because we're all here because we love music, right? So, you know, I don't want it to become mathematical to me. Okay, cool. So basically for, for you, it's a lot about the context around when you listen yeah. dictates how you appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to really think about it. Um, you know, in that way. But I mean, I still, I'm someone who gets the, I don't get the hair standing on the back of my neck, but I got, I get the chills. I get goosebumps. So if there's a song or an artist and they give me goosebumps, that's like an instant yes for me. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Do cool. you get that? Do you get the goosebumps or hair standing up? Uh, no, I like, I feel it, this, is, I feel in my heart. Sometimes it's, I find it, Certain songs, like certain music I love, it, it's painful how much I like it. <laughs> like I really, like I really, I really noticed that because you listen to so much music and you sort of like it and it passes. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's, it sort of fades quickly, but you really appreciate a song or an artist for a short period of time. But then when you yeah. go back to certain things you really like, there are certain things that I just, I can't believe <laughs> it's, it's like, I yeah. like, I can't believe how much I like this. <laughs> like, yeah. And it just hits and, you in this way that you're just like, yeah. I didn't even know I was feeling that. And now it's yeah. coming up. Totally. Yeah. And I think it, like you, there's so much different, so many different ways to experience music. I think hmm. that the feelings are quite diverse, I find. But I don't, I don't get the, I don't, I don't get, I don't know if I've ever had that hair standing on it. Hmm type stuff but i can really because i listen a lot on headphones when i'm walking and yeah. stuff like so i'm pretty focused on what i'm listening to and it's it, it's the feelings can be quite dramatic like mm. you, you know so but it, it's it's not it's nice it's nice to still get that but i but yeah. i find now it, it's funny that you asked the question like i find now that i get it more because i don't work so closely with music yeah. than like I used to. And I think what you're saying, I think is very, for people who work in and around music is quite dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I still scroll down and look and see what label people are on because you oh, want yeah. to put everything in a box. And I think that's, that's a disaster. Ultimately. But at the same time, that's just the way it is. If you've worked in music for so long, you want to know what distributor is it? What label are they on? Who's the manager? All that kind of stuff. And to be able to step back and, and enjoy stuff without judgment, I think is something I still yeah. work on. 100%, totally agree. All right, cool. Well, look, thanks for the chat. Um, job, it was super you. insightful and it was great. And thanks to Sarah G. Thank you, Sarah H. Thanks to Sarah G. Thanks to everybody who uh, came. It's nice to do it at this different time. It's good to get different people showing up. So I really appreciate it. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. If you want to leave your contact details in the chat, anyone, we'll leave it open for a couple more minutes. Um, otherwise, have a nice day. We'll talk to you soon. Come to the next event, yeah? Thanks, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>